This video demonstrates how to dismantle, clean and reassemble a Triumph Tiger 1050 starter motor. The motor I'm working on is from a 2008 Tiger 1050 that at the time the starter was removed covered approximately 30,000 miles and it's a model T1310605. The later models of Tiger and I believe the Sport were fitted with the model T1311 treble 14 and indeed this is the motor which is now included in the Sprague upgrade kits for the 2007 to 2013 Tiger. I have stripped both motors and they are essentially identical. The only difference being the later motor has a sealed bearing on the front of the main rotor shaft uh, which can't be greased. Um, but other than that, the architecture internally is absolutely identical. And so those of you who have the 131 treble 14 motor um, can also take heed of this video because it's uh, relevant for your starter motor as well. There are any number of reasons why you might wish to carry out this work. Most notably, if you're suffering from the infamous Triumph hot starting problem and you're looking to fettle the starter motor to hopefully have it working more efficiently. But also perhaps part of routine maintenance or to check on the wear of your brushes. Uh, that said, I've made this video in support of some tests which I've recently carried out in an attempt to get to the bottom of the hot start problem. And whilst I won't be referring to this during the video, I will include a link to the forum posts in the video description uh, for those of you who are interested in finding out a little bit more about the hot starting problem for that, that does seem to afflict triumph motorcycles anyway i trust you'll find this description of the work to be useful if you're planning on working on your own starter motor now obviously the first thing you have to do is remove the starter motor from the motorcycle it's covered in the workshop manual, but in essence, you just, using a long reach 22 millimeter spanner, um, undo the oil pressure switch and disconnect the feed, uh, the oil feed to the camshafts. And that's at the upper rear surface of the crankcases. Uh, and then undo the two bolts that retain the starter motor in place, undo the terminal nut, remove the cable, and then draw the starter motor out and um, perpendicularly to its mount um, and remove it from the side of the motorcycle. I won't dwell on that because uh, I'll just assume that people have done that and we have, them, we have the starter motor on the bench. Okay, so the first thing to do, just remove the terminal nut. Now, the end caps, you want to put them back on as they are now. And so, as a precaution, what I did or what I would advise is just mark them up with with tape. Now I'll explain what I'm doing in a minute. Um, on there and one there. And then we'll have another one just there. and likewise in there are actually indexing markings on the um, covers but uh, I prefer to put my own on and then I know exactly what's what it saved messing around so okay oops can get that on very straight okay right Having done that, just mark these with some felt tip and likewise this one. Now you'll notice I put some additional markings, um, so not markings, some additional tape underneath the head of the bolt. Now that's because this job is not something which is listed in the manual and there's no torque specifications for these um, bolts. So what I'd like to do is just put them back exactly where they come from. Now I can, having stripped several of these, I can tell you for sure that the torque that these are done up to from the factory is less than five newton meters, which is the lowest setting my torque wrench goes to. So my torque wrench is no good for this. So I just put them back where they came from. So what I do is Put a mark there, which is one peak, 
at the head of the bolt, another one there, and then using the felt tip, colour in that flat. Okay, likewise on the other one, put a line where the peak of the hex is, likewise another one, and then colour in that flat with the felt tip. Okay, you'll find that when you do these bolts up, they are completely loose to within about a quarter of a turn of where they want to end up. So there's no question of doing an extra revolution. Uh, you'd have to be a gorilla to do that. Um, so you just literally turn them until they start to nip and you'll find you're about a quarter of a turn from the end. But at least with the markings on like that, you know that you put them back exactly where they, where they came from. Right, the next thing you want to do, in fact, I would probably do this first. Just remove the um, the retaining nut on the top of the terminal post. That's a 10 mil nut. And if you just undo that, and then remove the insulator, the plastic insulator that sits underneath it. Now you will notice that there is a small O-ring there. I wouldn't get a blade under it or a cocktail stick and try and prise it up um, because in actual fact you can push it through very easily and if you try prising it you're likely to damage it. So the next thing then is to literally, oops, wrong span, or wrong socket I should say, you need an 8mm socket for this. So using your 8mm socket undo these. Now, under the head of each of these bolts, there's a small O-ring, and it's likely to stay under the head of the bolt, but it could be retained in the recess in the end of the cap there. So just be aware that it's there and don't lose it. Right, likewise. The second bolt. Right, now, having indexed these bolts, it's no good if you get them muddled up. So they both need Labelling, bolt number one and bolt number two. So we'll call this one number one. Take the bolt out and with a bit of masking paper, label it number one. Now make sure it goes back in the same hole and the other one, by default, is number two, but what the hell, might as well label it. Two. And I'll draw that. And mark that one up as bolt number two. Okay, now the next thing to do is withdraw the end cap here, but you need to be careful because the terminal post here is wired to the brush plate which is resi residing in this half. So you have to tease it off gently. Okay, and then push this terminal post down and you'll see that the o-ring is pushed out of its housing. Okay, once it's free, lift the end cap up to hook it off the terminal post and just withdraw it. And again, you'll notice another o-ring that resides on the outside face all the way around. Uh, you're not going to lose it, it doesn't seem to come off, it doesn't fall off freely, but anyway, it's there. Okay, now the next thing to do is withdraw the brush plate. The brushes are currently pushing down 
on the commutator and I think it's probably good practice you avoid damage if you just get your fingernails underneath the um, brushes and push them back into their housings as you draw you need to be a bit nimble with your fingers as you withdraw this off there we go that's done it and that avoids avoids them pushing on the commutator or getting chipped as they come off the end here Put your brush plate all down. Now, this kit is a lot cleaner than you're going to find this, simply because I've already had it apart and cleaned it. Uh, but anyway, so the next thing to do is take off this end, and it will just pull straight off. Put that down. Now, the actual rotor has got windings which are covered in this goop, which is which is insulating um, resin. You don't want to get that damaged, and it's quite easy to potentially skag it on the magnets as you pull it out. So I, what I like to do is pull it out fairly swiftly. So get hold of it and pull it out to about here, maybe. Get hold of it and then pull it out quick. And that way the magnets aren't going to pull the thing to one side and risk damaging those. Right, so there we are. The central housing, the main housing, and the rotor. And that is all there is to the internals of this um, starter motor. So the next thing to do then is to clean it up. As I said to you, mine's clean. Yours will be covered in black powder and grease and dust and all sorts of debris. So what I did is get hold of a soft cloth and some paraffin and wipe out the inside of the housing, get all the dust and rubbish out the inside of here. You're not going to do any damage with paraffin. I wouldn't risk soaking it because I think these magnets are held on with some kind of adhesive and the chances are um, you, you, it's always possible you could despond them. So just with a, a cloth uh, uh, with some paraffin on it, give it a good wipe out. Likewise, the rotor You've got to be careful with this, obviously, because you don't want to damage the commutator or the, um, or the windings. So I tended to use, clean off most of the loose dust and powder with just a, a, a soft, soft brush. So just give it a, just give it a brush like so. Uh, and then once you've got the majority of the loose stuff off, again, soft cloth, moistened with paraffin, you don't want it dribbling, running everywhere, but a soft cloth moistened with paraffin and just give it a wipe and to the best of your ability just clean it up. Um, as I said to you before, this bearing is sealed, that one's open. I think on the 114, the only difference that I can remember is both bearings are sealed. So with this one, when you reassemble it, if you wanted to, you could put a little bit of grease in there. But I'd be a little bit wary about packing too much in because again, when it starts whizzing around, you, you, you're potentially going to end up with grease flying around and soiling your commutator. Right, so you've cleaned up the main housing, put that to one side. Um, you've cleaned this up but we've not finished with it because we want to do a continuity test to check the state of the windings to make sure that they're okay so for that I'll use this stand that in there is it going to stand up? yeah need to be careful with it otherwise it will go flying right so This is potentially a little bit misleading, and if you've watched some YouTube videos on this, there are one or two gotchas, so I'll take you through it. The first thing to do is check continuity between the individual commutator pads and earth. Earth is either the outside of the rotor here or the end of the shaft here, um, and you shouldn't have continuity, okay? Um, you can do all of those if you want, but, but you shouldn't have continuity. The next thing that you want to do is test for continuity and or resistance in the windings. And the way you do that, set your flute meter, your own meter to resistance. And so they tell you on all the various videos, you want to put your probes on adjacent pads. I'm trying to do this without knocking it over. Put, put your probes on adjacent pads. In fact, I won't demonstrate it and you'll get a resistance reading. Now typically on a fluke it's about 0.1, between 0.1 and 0.3 ohms. And then having done two pads, move it 
to keep one on one pad and leapfrog. So you, you say do pads one and two, and then two and three, and then three and four, and then four and five, and you work your way all the way around. And what you're looking for, as the various videos and what have you will tell you, is for the resistance to be not a set level, but to be the same. If any of the resistance values are significantly different, that indicates a fault. Now, the additional test that you do is exactly the same as the one I've just described, except instead of putting your probes on adjacent pads, you put them on opposite pads. So you do 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, and then move to the next one down on this side, the next one up on that side, and you just go all the way around, and you're testing the opposite commutator pads, or as near opposite as possible, because I think in some respects they're, they're not absolutely opposite. Um, and again, you're looking for each resistance value to be the same. Now there's two potential faults that you might pick up here. The first one is, is if you've got a broken wire. In other words, there's no um, connectivity at all. And what will happen is you'll get an overload. In other words, infinite resistance and your, commutate, your, your, your rotors um, um, scrap. And the other possibility is you could get a short, in which case the the uh, current, instead of going all the way around the wirings and generating an electric field, um, it, it, it doesn't complete the path. But in, in that case, the resistance will go down. And so in theory, when you're doing these tests, you're looking for a resistance, for the resistances all to be the same, and maybe one resistance value to be significantly lower. And therein lies the problem. These, meet, these meters are designed for electronic components, and they, they measure the resistance on components of like 500 ohms or a kilo ohm or... 100 ohms or whatever, once you start talking about 0.1 ohms and 0.3 ohms, then they're good. So in actual fact, that test is pretty much redundant. The only um, useful test is to test to make sure that none of them give an overload. In other words, there's no broken circuit. But if you've got a short, I don't think you're going to find it with, with the um, ohm meter. Having said that, um, if you've got a genuine short and it doesn't produce the electric field required to work properly, when you load the starter motor up in the engine and try and start it, it probably just won't work. Right, so we've done what you need to do on that. And the next job is the brush plate itself. Now, let's have that O-ring off here. Little tiny o-ring. Pull that off, put that to one side, and then you've got the black plastic insulator pad. Now this is the one thing that you can potentially put on incorrectly. So I'll give you a demonstration of exactly how that goes back. And so we'll pull that off. Now this brush is the earth brush. Um, no, it's not. What am I talking about? It's a live brush, silly boy. Uh, and this, this one here is the earth. And what you're looking for is to make sure that the brush moves freely in the holder. If there's any stiction there, then of course you're not going to get a decent contact. And the same applies to the, to the uh, live terminal brush. Now, when you take your brush plate out, it's going to be covered in dust and black soot and all sorts of garbage. I don't think you'd do any harm to this at all by just dunking it in a plastic tray with some paraffin and just give it a, give it a wash with paraffin um, and then dry it. Um, now, service limits. These brushes, I know for a fact, are 12 millimeters when they're brand new. And I know that because I've stripped the starter motor that came in my Sprag upgrade kit and measured them. So just out of interest, this bike, bear in mind, has done 30,000 miles and the brushes are 11.62 millimeters and I know for a fact they're originals. So brush wear in these starter motors really is, is negligible. You can pretty much forget about it. I think if this starter motor is off a bike that's done 30,000 miles, and the brushes are 11.62 millimeters. That indicates half a mil wear every 30,000 miles. Um, you're going to have to live an awful long time, or more to the point, your bike's going to have to live an awful long time before you're going to have to worry about replacing your brushes. Um, 
Okay, so the contact surface of the brush needs to be absolutely clean. Don't go sanding it um, or, or abrading it in any way because of course it's already bedded in onto the commutator pads. So just give it a wipe with a soft cloth with petrol on it, that's what I used, and just rub and rub and rub until there's no more black comes off. And that way you know that there's no grease or rubbish on there and it's making the best contact possible. Likewise, the the earth brush, give it a good rub uh, with soft cloth with petrol on it um, and make sure that it's absolutely clean. Right now, one of the potential problem areas with this starter motor is the design of the brush plate and the way it contacts to earth and at this point it's probably worth demonstrating. Now, if you take the end cap and place it over the end there Within the body of the starter motor, placing the end cap on essentially results in a recess into which this fits. And the recess is very, very slightly wider by microns, very slightly wider than the brush plate itself. And it's formed by the upper surface is formed by that contact surface there. And the lower surface is formed by these small ledges, effectively, that the tray rests on. Now, the earth contact is made by virtue of the fact, first of all, that the brush plate sits on those little, little nubs, okay? So it earths through to the body via those. It's a very small contact area because you're limited to each one. The second earth contact is derived by virtue of the fact that each brush, now you have to bear in mind the live brush is missing, each brush exerts a force on the commutator pads. So that brush pushing downwards forces the brush plate in that direction. This brush pushing that way forces the commutator, sorry, forces the um, brush plate that away. The net effect of both is to, looking at it in the position of the camera, force the brush plate off at about half past two. And so this outer edge of the brush plate is pushed into the side of the, of the, of the cylinder body. And so it's not a bad idea to get some Solvol metal polish, polish up that edge, don't need to go mad, just remove any grease or um, any oxide that might have um, formed on the on the lay on the surface, uh, and likewise a very very degrease with a wipe and a very gentle polish with some metal polish on that surface there. Now, the the next thing to bear in mind is I did say that the rebate that this fits into is very slightly wider than the brush plate itself, and so in theory the brush plate can can kind of rattle about in there and, and, and I think that is actually part of the problem which leads to some of the earthing issues. But the design of it should prevent that. It's not a very satisfactory design but it should prevent it. Now of these tabs or nibs that are sticking out you've got one, two, three, four, hold on, yeah five, six and then you've got the seventh one there which is slightly raised, it's slightly higher. So these are all about four mils from the edge and that one's about a mil from the edge and that actually is an indexing nib. And it indexes with, where is it, that cutaway in the brush plate. So if I put it in position you'll see. So in other words the brush plate as it is now is resting on all those nibs but that one it's indexing on so it can't, it can't rotate. Now, therein lies the design. So basically, each of these little tabs that rests on a protrusion should be bent downward slightly. So that when it's sitting in position, it's actually raised a little bit. And the act of putting the end cap on and bolting it into position means that the end cap is bearing down onto this upper surface of the brush plate and it's being pushed against there simply by these tabs that have been bent downwards acting as a spring. Now given the way that given the way it's 
designed, you would expect this brush plate to be made out of a kind of fairly high strength sprung steel, but it's not. It's like cheese. It's, it's just the biggest load of rubbish you've ever come across. You bend these tabs down and then when they get flattened, that's exactly where they stay. They've got very, they, they, they're bound to have a small amount of, of, um, of, of spring to them, but they're very kind of plastic in the way they mould. I mean, you bend them and that's where they stay. So it's unusual. But um, accepting that, what it does mean is when you bend these tabs down, there's no point in bending them down by 30 degrees or 40 degrees. You're not going to achieve anything. All you're going to do is risk causing fatigue in the tabs itself. So when you bend them down, use needle-nosed pliers and bend them down by no more than five or six degrees. In fact, if you look down the line, I don't know where that will pick up on the video, down the line of what, what is essentially the upper face of the plate and then the tabs that are bent down, um, the, the difference is probably at the edge, probably no more than about half a mil, something like that. You don't bend them down by very much at all. Uh, you definitely don't want to risk damaging them. Anyway, so first of all, there's six of these that rest on the tab. So what you want to do is identify which ones need to be bent down. You don't bend down every single one, just the ones that are resting on a, on a, on a, a nib. So position it and think, right, that's one there and that one's one there. Bend it down a bit, bend it down a bit. Position it again, that's one there, that's one there. Bend it down, bend it down. Once you've bent down all six, Degrease the underside of the of the tabs and again a very very light white with some solvol. Make sure you polish off all the solvol. I don't know whether it has any corrosive effects or whatever, but not a bad idea. It certainly affects probably the, the, the conductivity. So give it a good wipe, get it all off. Um, but again, don't go ballistic, you're just polishing it enough to remove any oxide or any grease. Um, now the next thing to do is do the same on the upper surface because it's the upper surface which contacts with with that surface on the end of the cap, which is the main earth, I believe. So go around the upper surface and give that, again, a light polish. Again, don't go mad, just enough to take off any oxide and any grease. Um, light polish from Solvol. And likewise, the mating face of the end cap. So again, degrease it and a very, very light white with a um, little bit of Solvol. And again, to the best of your ability, get all the Solvol off. Right, so we've made sure that the brush plate is prepped, we've checked the brush wear, we've cleaned the brushes, and we're ready to reassemble. But before we do, I'm just going to give you one demo because there's one thing that can go wrong when you put this thing back together again. Well, probably several things, but this is one obvious one. Because when you take this apart, you'll have taken it apart and you won't have checked how this pad goes in and how it's orientated. So if we look on the inside of the end cap you can see a flat machined face on the inside of the hole here. Now this insulating pad first of all has got a little collar on it and so it's obvious that the collar goes into the hole. So you know which way round it goes, that's the first thing. Now it's also, it's not square, it's rectangular and if you put it one way I don't know whether the camera will pick that up. Um, the length of the pad is an identical length to the rebate in the in the end cap, and obviously that's designed to stop it twisting when the when the when the when the nuts are done up. If you put it, turn it through 90 degrees and put it the other way, whoops, obviously it fits, but what you'll find is that the pad is about one millimeter narrower than the rebate. So that's the way it goes. It goes that way so that the, the pad occupies the entire width of the rebate. Now if you look carefully at the insulating pad you'll notice that it's got a slightly raised lip on one edge and that raised lip goes at the far end. It goes nearest the end of the end cap. So again, if I put it in position, you should hopefully be able to see if I get it right into the camera. So that's how it goes with the raised lip right at the back and the pad itself is occupying the full width of the rebate. Now what I tend to do is assemble the whole thing and because this 
post is loose before you get the nut on it, the post, as you're assembling it, goes in and out the hole and rattles around, and it allows this thing to spin around underneath. So even though you might put it in in the right place, by the time you do the nut up, it's no longer in the right place. So it's a, not a bad idea to nip it up, and then before you very finely assemble it, crack it open a little bit and have a look in with a, with a torch and just make sure that this thing is in the right place. Okay, so we've covered that. So time to reassemble. So the first thing is to take your rotor shaft and put it back in the housing, making sure obviously that we get it the right way around. Okay, so we know that the brush plate, ah, I've forgotten something, I forgot something, you all would. Cleaning up the um, commutator pads. So, sorry, let's go back. Nothing ever works like you're wanting it to when, when you're doing something ad hoc. Anyway, um, there is a tendency for people to think you want to return these to brass, some nice brass shiny finish. And uh, certainly the new starter motor, that's how they look when I took the, the, the new one apart. It's absolutely just shiny brass. But the effect of the motor spinning on the, carb on the, on the carbon brushes, basically the brushes pull small amounts of copper out of the commutator and that combines with carbon dust and you end up with a kind of a bronze brown, what they call brush sheen um, on the commutator pads. Now, because it's effectively carbon and copper particles, it's highly conductive and you don't need to clean it off. Um, you run more risk of damaging the commutator pads by sanding them or trying to dress them than you do just by leaving them alone. That said, it's very tempting to do and uh, I made a little bit of an attempt on my other starter motor but I didn't bother with this one, I left it. Um, two things you can do then, they, they do say don't use sandpaper. I'm not quite sure why really, because I think if you use a very fine, you certainly don't want to use 40 grit, but if you use something very fine like 1500 wet and dry, it's essentially polishing. It, it's it's the, the abrasive um, finish it, it, it's going to impart on the pads is so microscopic, it's essentially polishing it. And I found that removed the, um, the sheen fairly well. But you can buy an official dressing stick, which is like made out of a chalky compound. I'll put a link to this in the, in the video. What you're supposed to do is spin the rotor up at speed and then just put this, rest it on it, and, and um, hey, presto, it, it uh, removes all the, all the sheen off the commutator pad. But as I say, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'd bother. But you do need to differentiate the markings where the brushes have been. You do need to differentiate brush sheen from grease and, and general gunk that, that seems to accumulate. And when I, when I opened this thing, there was black soot and dust everywhere. Uh, and so I would suggest that probably a, a, a rag softened with some petrol and just wipe it to, to clean it up. Now another area that's important to clean is the gaps in between the commutator pads themselves. Because if you get carbon in there, it can cause a short between, between consecutive pads. And you can get what they call an arc over, uh, so that the electricity goes from one pad to the next rather than through, the, rather than through the, the, the armature windings. And that can cause serious damage to the starter motor itself. So that's something that is worth cleaning. Um, and what you can do is get a cocktail stick, don't use a blade. I think there's a tendency for people to use blades for everything. You, metal on metal is not such a great idea. Use a cocktail stick and scrape it out with, a, with, a, with the broken end of a cocktail stick. Um, what I found that actually worked quite well for me was just to get a piece of cloth, some isopropyl alcohol, put the cloth over my fingernail and then just rout the groove, rub it backwards and forwards with my fingernail until the cloth eventually started coming out clean. And uh, fingernail fits in there beautifully. Um, just as long as you've got some fingernails, of course, but there you go. Right, so, sorry, I had to back pedal there, so let's go back to rear assembly. So, making sure that you put it in the right way round. Now, this thing will grab, because the magnets are quite strong. So, what I tend to do is put it in until... Just make sure that's it. So the the outside body of the rotor is just on the magnets now, and then just rather than try and feed it in, just let go of it. Okay, so we're in. And next thing to go on is your end cap. So find your indexing marks 
and not too critical at this stage. And there we go, we're on. And I think I mentioned it earlier, that bearing on the 605, you can put a little bit of grease in there, go steady, because it's only gonna fling out everywhere. Um, put a little bit of grease in there. On the on the 114s, I think they're sealed for life. Right, so, there we go, that's on. Now the next thing is to put the brush plate on. So we need to put the positive brush back in. When you're doing this, by the way, be very careful not to keep flexing this. Flex it as little as you can, because these copper strands will get fatigued otherwise, and you don't want to start breaking them. Um, right, and just make sure that it slides backwards and forwards like so, which it does. Um, and put your plastic insulator pad on, making sure that the raised edge is downwards. Okay, and in other words, the collar is on the outside. Now, when you put this on, remember that this cutaway here locates on the raised nib. So turn it around and it's there. So this is a little bit fiddly. You need to be a little bit dexterous. Putting your thumbs onto the brushes, push them in as far as you can, and then lower this down. Whoops, I've let go of it. All right push them in and lower it down onto the commutator. That way you're not scraping it or catching the edges as you push it on. And then once they're on, uh, where's my... Now, because they're not mounted on properly, you don't want to go turning this on the, com on the commutator, but you can turn the whole caboodle by turning the, the shaft at the, at the bottom here. And what we're looking for is where the hell my indexing. Did I put it in the wrong place? Where is it? Where's it gone? Um, I've lost it. I think it's over there. Right, so turn it around. If I look for it, I should be able to see it. There it is, there. I don't know quite how I did that. Anyway, turn it around like that by turning the shaft, get it into the right position, and then lower the plate on. And then again, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but you've got the cutaway there, and you can see the indexing mark, the indexing uh, protrusion is just sticking through. Right, both pads are on, and my insulating cap fell off, so put that back on. Right, now the next bit is a bit fiddly, and that's putting the end cap back on. So the first thing to do, feed the terminal post into the hole, and pull it through. And then I've got one finger holding the holding the brush plate in position, as you can see there, because it does tend to want to spring out. And then gently Now you can probably understand why that black pad isn't necessarily where it started off life um, with all this jiggling about. Okay, I think that's... Okay, right. Now, at this point, I would be inclined to put your O-ring on. You see what I mean about it being a bit fiddly? Actually, no, let's, let's leave that for a minute. Let's uh, try and... but you don't want to rush this, you definitely need to be patient. Are we more or less, ah, okay, that's why we're not, we're not 
lining up our indexing marks, are we? So that will. That's that's more like it. I wonder why the why the terminal post was twisted. Right. Okay. So when you put it back together again, good idea to put it back where it's lined up. Now at this point, with your terminal post pointing upright, feed your o-ring on. Now before you go any further, you could with a cocktail stick, a little bit of silicon grease on a cocktail stick if you wanted to, and wipe the washer at this point. I would wipe it now rather than um, before you put, thread it down because obviously you don't want to get silicon grease all over your live terminal um, threads. But um, I'm not going to grease this one because it's pre-greased. They've greased it the last time I put it together. Right, now at this point, put your plastic insulator on with the dish upwards and obviously this flanged nut sits in there and then turn that and just take up the slack you are know, you're not tightening it all you're doing is stopping the thing from floating around on the inside now at this point I would turn it upside down and have a look yeah you see it's not in the right position some light on that so I can see what I'm doing. Okay I went off camera for a minute to do that. It is fiddly. So the um, I've tightened the nut up by by hand and the um, pad and the terminal post are in position and as I said a minute ago bear in mind that the base of this post has got a, 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 a square base to it and that sits in a recess in that insulating pad as well. So having got that in position this needs to go on. Make sure that your indexing marks are more or less in the right place. Now this bit again is slightly fiddly. Push that. So reluctant. <laughs> Not had this problem before, but uh, certainly. Reluctant. Have I got the indexing marks still lined up? I wonder. No, not quite. That would help, wouldn't it? Right, that's on. Ah, uh, that's more like it. Okay, right. Now, on this occasion, the last little bit has gone together perfectly okay, but quite often what will happen is when you put this end cap on, it goes about that far, and you end up with a gap of about like that. Don't be tempted to think that's on now and bolt it together, because if you do, you'll do all sorts of damage. Um, it's not on. And what tends to happen, I'll just demonstrate, you end up fettling and going backwards and forwards and faffing, thinking, why won't it go, why won't it go? And then suddenly it clicks, there you go, it's gone on. You see that? that's on now and you can bolt it together so with that together make sure your indexing marks are lined up perfectly likewise on the front turn it round make sure they're lined up perfectly and put your bolts back in we'll start with bolt number one if I can get the paper off it that's hole number two that's hole number one and there we go. I've <laughs> got paper stuck to my fingers. Pretty good, isn't it? There we go. Get rid of that. And now I'll drop the span on the floor. Okay. Right. So, again, make sure that O ring's on the 
under the head of the bolt, put a little bit of silicon grease on it if you want. When I say silicon grease, don't take shortcuts and use ordinary castor oil, LM or just ordinary grease because ordinary grease is mineral based and it will basically bugger up the, the, the rubber seals. It must be silicon. If you've got no silicon grease, don't use anything. Um, ordinary grease is a disaster when it comes to rubber seals unless they're specifically designed for it, which obviously some are. Right, and again, that's bolt number two, put it in. Tighten her down. do that as tight as I can now that's as tight as I can using just my fingers on there and I've got about a quarter of a turn to get those indexing marks to line up from there so again make sure that these are perfectly lined up they are on that end and they are on that end we're good to go um, so put that down Okay, that's starting to bite, and there's my face there, so it's about a third of a turn from there. Not quite there yet. Not quite there. Weeny, weeny bit more. Weeny, weeny bit more. That's there. This is number two. Not quite there yet. Not quite. Pretty much perfect and tiny weeny bit more. Right, that's exactly how it came apart. And then one final thing is nip up this nut here. Don't over tighten it, it just needs a very gentle nip because bear in mind what it's doing is it's sandwiching two plastic insulating pads. Plastic's not designed to take massive um, loads and it, they will break, so just a gentle nip. Take off all your insulating tape and then that's job done. Right, there's one other thing that's worth mentioning. And that is that the manual states that when you put the starter motor back on, you tighten the mounting nuts to 10 newton meters, but you also tighten the terminal nut for the live power feed also to 10 newton meters. Now, I would strongly advise against that because 10 newton meters is a lot, and if you tighten that nut up to 10 newton meters, you're twisting the whole of the assembly and, and you're, you're almost certainly going to break the plastic pads. It didn't say, or doesn't say in the manual, but I suspect the 10 newton meters probably comes from the fact that maybe you should get an open-ended spanner on the lower nut and then tighten the top one onto it whilst holding that lower one. Now if you do that, you could do it up to 10 newton meters, no problem, without actually putting any force on the assembly at all. But interesting enough, my Speed Triple RS, which is a 2020 bike, has got a Mitsuba starter motor, it's a different starter motor, but the terminal post is the same. And when I check the manual, it says five newton meters. So I suspect that either the torque setting in the 1050 manual is wrong, or 
more likely um, it probably was 10 newton meters and they've had breakages and so they've changed it but uh, either way I wouldn't risk it the reality is of course that when the starter motor is mounted on the bike it's damn difficult to get access to that with a torque wrench anyway and so most people wouldn't use a torque wrench they just do it by feel if you do it by feel using a small spanner that is a self locker it's not going to come undone anyway and as long as you again I would as you assemble it clean any grease off the shaft here and polish up the underside of the the um, the nut polish the terminal itself on the on the live feed the crimped connector and just screw that down and just nip it up by hand but caution beware 10 newton meters don't go breaking it okay that's it sorry about all the faff nothing ever goes quite right does it but um hopefully that gave people an insight into what they're likely to find when they open up their starter motor the fundamental difference between this and what you'll find when you open yours is that this is already clean yours is going to be full of soot and grease and such like but they're very easy to clean up um, that's it thank you thank you very much